Welcome to a Not Avenue Christian Church video production. Not Avenue Christian Church is a non-denominational, multi-ethnic church located at 315 South Not Avenue, a quarter mile south of Lincoln in Anaheim, California. We hope you will be blessed and encouraged by today's message. Good evening. Good to see you here. Welcome to Not Avenue Christian Church. This is your first time here. We're Super glad that you are here. Very excited that you are here to continue our series with us. Um, as we walk through this, you can see you're going to open up your bulletin there. There's going to be some sermon notes in there. Basically, what it's going to look like, it's going to be the text that we're going through. So we're going to walk through all of these and um, just kind of have it there before you can take notes on that, take notes in your Bible. I would always recommend that you do bring your Bible. Um, I'm always a fan of having the book right there uh, because, you know, I know at my house, my TV doesn't display uh, Bible verses, and I don't have little pieces of paper with Bible verses on them. So it's good to know how to navigate through uh, the book. Now, as we walk through this, we're ending up a series called Heritage. And Heritage, the tagline underneath it, you can see it on the banner behind me, it says, the way it's always been. The way it's always been. And if you can even tell by the graphic, or you could tell by the graphic on your um, outline there, you see kind of a gap, a space in between two spots, and then you see kind of these roots going uh, in between the two of them. The idea is there's the first century church and the 21st century church. That's the inception of Christianity right after Jesus Christ's resurrection, his commission of his disciples, and then you have us, the 21st century not every Christian church. And what we're trying to say is what is the seamless principles, what are the characteristics of the descriptions that were made of them, and how should they be made of us now? And as we've walked through that, what we've seen is there, we've kind of unpacked four main descriptions that the New Testament church had that we feel like we should continue in the 21st century. Now, of course, there's certain things that they're going to do a little different. We have iPads and screens and, and chairs. We don't sit on dirt, right? So there's some things that change, but there are things that don't change. And what we looked at is some things that shouldn't change. There's four things. We said the first one was boldness. The church prayed for boldness, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and gave them boldness, and they impacted the world around them. We saw that the church was generous, that their family that they were building because of their faith together like, built up this generosity and compassion, and they said, we don't want there to be any poor among us. We don't want there to be any needs among us. So they gave generously, sold homes, sold land, so they were incredibly generous. Last week, we looked at how they were unified. How this family was made, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and it fell upon everybody. So it didn't matter the color of skin, it didn't matter your, your past, your background, everybody was family. And because everybody's family, everybody's off the bench, everybody's doing the work of the kingdom of God. So this last one we're doing is about sacrifice. We're trying to answer this question. How far was the church willing to go to reach people outside of its faith community? How far were they willing to go to reach people in their culture? So think of it. If there's like a, a line in the sand, they're saying, I'm not going to go this far. I, I can't do that to reach you. What we're going to look at is how far can we run? And this is true in our 21st century culture. This has become one of the most important questions. Is, is how far do we go to reach people who don't yet know Jesus Christ? Now, as we walk through this, I think what we're going to find is to answer this question, we have to go to a very um, strange Old Testament practice, the practice of circumcision. Now, this is not a message about circumcision, kind of. I'm not going to go through any detailed analogy of what circumcision is. But, and this may sound very strange, but when we look in the book of Acts, circumcision is one of the the biggest topics in the book of Acts. And when we look at it, we actually see how the New Testament church related to this topic shows us how far they're willing to go to evangelize and what line are they not willing to cross. So as strange as that sounds, just walk through this with me and we'll see how this kind of Old Testament um, custom shows us a principle that the New Testament church had and their willingness to go and reach people who don't yet know Jesus. Now, if you're not familiar with circumcision, let's just for a minute do a little bit of background. In Genesis chapter 17, so way back before Jesus was ever born, in Genesis 17, God meets this guy named Abraham. Or maybe a better way to say it is Abraham meets this guy called God. 
And as God and Abraham are talking, God goes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want to make a covenant with you, which means an agreement, a promise. Me and you are going to be contractually obligated to each other. That's kind of what he's saying. And so God says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. But see, I, I want to use you specifically, in a special way. Not only you, but also your descendants. But I want you to be different, set apart. So as the story unfolds, we see several things that make them different, whether the clothes that they wear, what they eat, all those things. But the first thing that we're seeing as a sign that the New Testament, sorry, sign that God's people are different is this sign of circumcision. So God says in Genesis 17, Abraham, this is what you're going to do. Once a male child is born, eight days later after his birth, you're going to circumcise him. And this will be a sign that you're in my family. Now, way back in Genesis 17, that happened. If you fast forward all the way to Jesus, circumcision was still seen as incredibly important. It was an indispensable marker of the people of God. The idea is if you weren't cut, you weren't family. doesn't matter who grandpa is, grandma is, how much work they do at the synagogue. If you weren't cut, you weren't family. Now, the New Testament church starts to deal with this struggle because what we looked at last week was that what makes you family? Faith. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. Faith makes you family. Well, now we have this Old Testament idea that you have to get cut to be family. Okay, so now there's tension. There's, there's conflict. And this guy, Paul, specifically deals with it. One of the ones that saw the risen Jesus Christ started to preach the gospel. He wrote probably a large portion of the New Testament that we know of. I mean, just, just an influential Christian leader. He would deal with circumcision, it seems like, in every letter. In Romans chapter 2, in Romans chapter 3, and 4 and 5, in Romans chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Colossians 2 and 4, I believe Philippians 2 as well. He deals with circumcision almost every single letter. This is a big deal for him because his message was faith and your family. You don't need to get cut to be family. And as we look at Paul's relationship and Paul's argument with circumcision, we're going to see how far was Paul willing to go. So I invite you to go ahead and take that sheet out of your paper. We're going to look at kind of two principles. What were the two guiding lines that said this is how far we're willing to go to reach people who don't yet know Jesus Christ. This is Galatians chapter 2 starting with verse 1. Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It's also, it's in your bulletin there. It's going to be on the screen, and I invite you to, to open your Bible and read it from there if you have one. This is Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It says this, Then after 14 years, I went up again. Now the person who's talking is Paul right now. He's talking about a visit he's going to have to Jerusalem. He's been doing ministry for a very long period of time. He's preaching to Gentiles, people who aren't yet Jews, or aren't Jews. He's preaching to them, and then he's going to go back to Jerusalem for a certain reason. So that's what it says. So 14 years went along, and I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus. This guy is very important. Titus, full Greek. No Jewish descent whatsoever. That'll be important. You'll see. We'll get to that. So Titus is kind of a traveling companion. He's a fellow believer with Paul, but he's not Jewish at all. Verse 2. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Now, at first glance, what this seems like is Paul's trying to validate his ministry. Like Paul's been preaching this gospel away from Jerusalem, which was kind of the center of authority for the New Testament church. He's been preaching out here. If you just read this at the surface, it seems like Paul's saying, oh, I've been preaching this. I better get approval from the teacher. Right? I better get approval from the disciples, the closest followers of Jesus Christ. But that's not, that's not what's happening. Paul is very confident in his message. He got it from Jesus Christ himself the risen Lord. So it's not that. What's happening is there are these false teachers who are coming in. And as they come into the Galatian church, they're saying, guys, this guy Paul is preaching something very weird. You see, Jesus' closest followers over here teach this. And this guy Paul is teaching this. So there are two different messages. And Paul sees this. And Paul wants to fight against this. So what Paul says, I got to go to Jerusalem to clear up all this drama to clear up all this confusion, to clear up all this division, because what these people are saying is not true. My message, their message, it's the same thing. It's faith in Christ alone. 
And so as, they, as Paul goes to Jerusalem, he goes there, and on his way, he meets up with some of these guys who are what he would call false brothers, people spreading these rumors. And this is what happens. This is verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised. So here we go. This is our topic, right? Not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, so they might bring us into slavery. You just look at how these guys are described. They slipped in. They're brought in. They're described as almost traitors. They're coming in to the camp and trying to cause division, but they're doing it in church. They're coming into a church hoping to break the leadership that Paul has with this church, and Paul does not like this. And they come in there and they say, hey, what's this Greek guy doing over here? Saying he's believing in Jesus. No, 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 no. you got to be Jewish. So you got to get circumcised. you got to adopt our customs. you got to adopt our rules. You have to get cut to be saved. You have to get cut to be saved. Now the question is, what's Paul going to do with that? Is Paul going to accommodate that? Is Paul going to say, uh, okay, Jesus, and you got to get cut, and then, and then everything is okay? Is that what he's going to do? Right? Let's look. This is what he does in this situation. Verse 4. So the false believers come in. They're trying to put them into slavery. Verse 5. To them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment. So what does Paul say? Absolutely not. You guys are so wrong. You don't need to be cut to be saved. You don't have to have circumcision to be a part of the family. It's faith in your family. So no, there's no way. He, he's not going to accommodate. So Paul is not willing to cut Titus. It's too far. He's got to draw the line in the sand and say, no, can't go that far. Okay, now look what happens. Let's read the rest in verse 6. We'll go away to verse 9. Or actually, let's look and answer the question first. Why was he so serious about this? I mean, why did he not make this accommodation? If it's just a medical procedure, why not just do it and just give in? Look what Paul says is at stake if he were to cut his brother Titus. It says in verse 5, To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So what is Paul is saying is at stake? The message is at stake. We can't cut the message. The message is faith alone in Jesus Christ alone saves you, and that's it. The only way to be a part of the family of God is to trust in Jesus Christ. So we cannot cut the message. We cannot cut the message. And Paul is adamant about this. In Galatians 5, if you go a couple chapters over, Paul would say, if you accept circumcision, if you give in to these false brothers who say you have to be cut to be saved, Paul would say, you have severed yourself from Jesus Christ. You have fallen from God grace. I mean, that's some radical terminology there. Paul is saying this is not just a line in the sand. This is a cliff's edge. You cannot go over this or you're destroyed. You cannot change the message. Paul is not trying to put lipstick on the gospel to make it look more attractive. He's got to preach the same exact message. Now look at how the Jerusalem, the people closest to Jesus Christ, his disciples, look at how they respond to this. We're going to read verse 6 now all the way to verse 9. Matt, can I do something to help my microphone? No? We're just going to endure it? We can do it. We can do it. We can do it, right? They're all like, yes. I can hear it. It sounds really bad to me, but we'll get through it. Okay, verse 6. And from those who seem to be influential, what were they makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential or influential added nothing to me. So Paul's saying, hey, I came to these guys, and they didn't change my gospel. They didn't change my message. They kept it the same. They didn't cut anything. I wasn't going to cut anything. I preached Christ, and that was it. So they didn't add anything to me, verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter 
for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for, the, for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, again, closest followers of Jesus Christ, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship. So they gave him the stamp of approval. Paul did not cut the message. Now here's the curveball. That feels good. We're like, okay, we can't change Christianity. We can't take Christ out of Christianity. Right? We can't take the cross. We can't take sin. We can't change the message of the Bible. We can't change the message of Jesus Christ. Well, that still doesn't answer the question. How far do we go? We know we can't cross the line of changing the message, but how far can we go? And it has to do with another situation with circumcision. And it's going to get a little confusing. Look at this. It's Acts chapter 16, starting with verse 1. Now remember, Paul said, Timothy, or sorry, Titus, you're not going to get circumcised. That's going to change the message. So we're not going to cut you. We're not going to cut our message. So he doesn't cut his brother. But look at this. A couple years later, Paul's doing ministry again. And look what happens. This is Acts chapter 16, verse 1. It says, A disciple was there named Timothy. Not Titus, Timothy. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek, verse 2. He was well spoken by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews. What? So over here, he's like, there's no way, we're not cutting you, Titus, don't worry about it. It's going to change the message. And you think Titus is like, I'm covered. And then Timothy over here, Timothy's like, hey, Paul, I would like to do some ministry. Ooh, you need to get cut. Wait, what? Like, I almost imagine, now again, in my mind's eye, my imagination can run wild, but I envision Timothy and Titus meeting for the first time. Maybe Paul wants them to meet at the nearest Jerusalem Starbucks, and so he says, hey, we're going to do Bible study. I'll meet you there at 9 o'clock. Paul's a little late. He's an apostle. He can do that. He's seen the reason Christ. You can give him a leeway of 10 minutes, right? So Timothy and Titus, they're standing around, maybe a bar stool like this, and they're kind of sitting there, and and Titus looks at Timothy and says, Timothy, why are you? are you moving? You seem very uncomfortable. He's like, oh man, oh, I just, I had this procedure done and, uh, you know, Paul was with me and he, he, I wanted to do ministry and he said I had to get cut. And Titus almost doesn't want to say anything. He's like, um, you know, I did ministry with Paul too. Yeah, I didn't get, he, I didn't, I didn't have to get cut. And you could just see like Timothy like, wait, what? Then, of course, Paul comes in, ding, ding, right, through the Starbucks. And you could almost see the glare from Timothy to Paul, like, hey, buddy, that hurt. I'm a grown man. Why the difference there? What, what, what's going on there? It's very confusing. Why was Paul willing to say, no, this is the bridge? And he, he says in Galatians so much that if you change the message, which he equated with cutting Titus, then you've jumped over an abyss, So is Paul at the bottom of this abyss that he created? Or is he doing something different? Let's look. Acts chapter 16. There's several clues in here that show us what is really happening. Okay, let me read it again starting with verse 1. A disciple was there named Timothy. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So a little bit of background there. We have a mixed marriage there. We have a Jewish woman... And we have a full Greek male, and they get married. What that tells us there already is there's already some compromise. The Jewish woman should not have married, according to Old Testament law, she should not have married somebody who wasn't a believer in monotheism, in Judaism. Now, he could have converted over, been from an outside foreign people and come in, from a different culture and come in, but that's not the case here. And when we look at this, we never hear of Timothy's uh, dad being a believer, In fact, everything in the absence of what Paul says, we would assume that he is not. But does that mean that Timothy is not a Jew? No, it means he is a Jew. Because the Jewish bloodline runs through the mother. So since his mother is Jewish, he's considered Jewish. But it says he's not circumcised, which would mean he's an apostate Jew. He's not part of the family. He would be looked at by all the other Jews of that time as an outcast as an outcast. Okay, so let's keep reading. We are on verse 2. 
He was well spoken by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. So they know of Timothy. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because, so now we get the reason, because of the Jews who were in these places, for they all knew his father was a Greek. It's weird. In two verses, the writer of Acts, Luke, would tell us that Timothy's dad is a Greek. Why would you tell us that twice? Because it's important. This is a big deal. Not only is his dad a Greek, it said this is known amongst all the Jews that he's a Greek. So now everybody knows, all the Jews know that he hasn't been circumcised, that he's an apostate, that he's he's from a non-legal marriage is what Deuteronomy would call that marriage. They all know this. His reputation may be as a good boy, but as an apostate Jew. Now, when it says the term the Jews, that word is used, that phrase is used, the Jews, 85 times in the book of Acts. And every single time it's used, almost without exception, it always refers to an unbelieving Jew, somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So if you put all of that background together, what do we know? All the unbelieving Jews in the region knew that Timothy was an apostate Jew. Paul knows this. And Paul says, how is this going to work? If I go up to my Jewish brothers who I'm trying to reach, and I want to bring you into synagogue or bring you into the temple, how is having an apostate Jew, a part of my entourage, going to give me credibility? Because they're going to look and they're going to go, whoa, 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 whoa. We know this guy. Right? His dad's a Greek. He's not circumcised. He's an apostate Jew. So before Paul could ever open his mouth, before Timothy could ever say anything about Jesus Christ, he'd be shut down. He'd be shut down. So what's Paul doing there? See, the situations are different. With Titus over here, we had the idea that outside pressure, not inside pressure, outside pressure, false brothers were saying, you have to be cut to be saved. Over here, we have Timothy Not outside pressure, inside pressure. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, says, in order for us to be heard, you have to be cut. He's not telling Timothy, in order for you to be saved, you have to get cut. He's not telling him that. We realize later in Galatians and in Corinthians that Paul thinks that circumcision is meaningless. He's indifferent to it. It has no meaning to it. So over here, it's cut to be saved. Over here, it's cut to be heard. So Paul says, I'm willing to to ask you to cut yourself just so we could be heard. He is sensitive. He is sympathetic to those he's trying to reach. What is he doing? He's cutting the method, not the message. The circumcision of Timothy in no way deforms Paul's message. A perfect way to see this is in the last verse of Acts chapter 16 and verse, uh, verse 4 here. It says, For they all knew his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decision that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. Now, what's that about? A little background there tells us that's the Jerusalem council. What was the decision laid out by the apostles and the elders? You go back to Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, all of the closest followers of Jesus Christ, all of the authorities of the church, what Ephesians 2 would say is the foundation of the church, the authorities of the church came together and decreed this. Faith alone makes you family. You don't have to be circumcised. So think about that for a moment. Paul is carrying a message that says Faith alone makes you family, not circumcision, but he asks his buddy to get circumcised. So it tells us Paul is not contrary to his message. He wants to cut the method. Now, would Paul ask somebody else to do this but not himself? It was kind of the easy road. Hey, Timothy, you've got to get cut. I'm already been cut, but you've you've got to do it. No, Paul would take the same burden on himself. Paul was willing to sacrifice to reach people. He called Timothy to sacrifice, to get cut. But Paul was a prime example of suffering. Suffering so he could get heard by people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, Paul tells us that he was beaten with 39 lashes. And this beating happened five times. Now, if you back up there and you look at the historical context there, Most commentators, when they look at that scene, say this. What's happening to Paul is he's being beaten in the synagogue. 
He's being beaten by the Jews. Now, why would Paul take 39 lashes five times? Because this is how it worked in the synagogue. If you wanted to be a part of that community, you had to submit to that discipline. If you didn't submit to the discipline, you were outside of the community. So Paul would come into this community, preach about Jesus Christ, which they would call blasphemy. They would then say, we need to punish this blasphemer. If Paul just ran and said, I'm not submitting to this punishment, he's no longer a brother. But what does he do? He says, I'm going to preach Christ, but I'm going to stay in this community. So beat me. Five times he says that. Thirty-nine lashes just so he can be heard. So it's not that he just asked Timothy to make a sacrifice so he could be heard. Paul was willing to take it on himself. What does that tell us? Why did the first century church have so much impact? Because they never cut the message, but they always cut the message, the method. They were always willing to sacrifice, even if it meant pain, discomfort, a beating, or an uncomfortable surgical procedure. They would do it just to be heard. And Paul lived on this balance. He lived on this line. Let me show you in, in Corinthians, if you just take your paper and flip it over. Look at this balance that Paul walks. Now this is in the same letter to the same church, the church of Corinth. Look down on the back of your paper. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, both these passages are written to the same church. And look at this balance that he's doing. Don't cut the message, but cut the method. Look what he's doing. Verse 1, or sorry, verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 1. This is what he says. He says, For the Jews demand signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom. But Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified. So they want something. And what do I give them? I give them the message. I give them Jesus Christ crucified. But what is it to them? Is it attractive? Is it appealing? Is it lipstick on the gospel? Is he, is he making it look beautiful? No, look what it says. He preaches Christ crucified, and what happens is it's a stumbling block to Jews, and it's folly to the Gentiles. See, there's this strange kind of dichotomy we live in, this almost contradiction, this paradox we live in as Christians. Is we never want to do anything to offend anybody, but we have a message that is the most offensive message. We never want to offend anybody. That's our method. We want to show love, compassion. We want to care for people. But our message is one of the most offensive things, if not the most offensive message. Because nothing worse can be said about you than what is said about you in the gospel. Nothing worse can be said about me than what's said about me in the gospel. Now let me unpack that. Why is that true? What does the gospel say about us? If you're a Christian, you sit there and you think, what does the gospel first tell you about yourself? The gospel first tells you what? We are all guilty of crimes that deserve eternal punishment forever. Can you say anything worse? I mean, you could say a lot of things and a lot of insults. You can, you can say a lot of bad things. But what is worse than saying you are a criminal whose crimes are not just a life sentence but an eternal life sentence? That's how egregious your crimes are to your God. Nothing worse can be said about you than what's said about you in the gospel. But at the same time, nothing greater can be said to you than what's said to you in the gospel. Because even on that balance that says nothing worse can be said about you than what's said about you in the gospel, you are a criminal who is worthy of eternal punishment. On the other side, it says this, that judge who should punish you is willing to carry out the sentence on himself. He's willing to take all the lashes, do all the time, so you can be free. Not by anything you do, but by simply believing in him as the merciful judge. Believe, and you're out of jail. Not by good merit, not by good behavior. Just by simply believing. That's, there's no better news than that. But we find ourselves in that dilemma. Right? I know when I, I try to share the gospel with friends, 
One of the biggest things that comes up is, Paul, I just can't believe in a God who would send people to hell. Well, what do you do at that moment? If we're not going to cut the message, what do you do at that moment? Well, you're stuck. That's checkmate. I can't tell you, uh, God doesn't send people to hell. I can't do that. Now I'm, now I'm cutting the message. Now I'm taking a piece out to make it look better. Now I'm Botoxing God's message, right? That's what I'm doing. But what do you do? You tell them the whole story. You say, you know what? I understand it is hard to believe in a God who would send people to hell. But can you imagine a God who would go through hell for you? I know it's hard to conceive of a judge who would hold you accountable to all your crimes and keep you locked up forever. I know it's hard to accept that as loving, but can you believe that that very same judge will be willing to slam the door on himself and not you and let you go free? It's true the gospel is offensive. But the full gospel is the greatest message of joy, the greatest message of love that can ever be. But we as Christians cannot deny there are some things in this message that are a stumbling block that look foolish or, or a folly, or even, for lack of a better term, offensive. But in the grand scheme of the entire gospel, they are minuscule compared to the love and the care and the open arms of the gospel. In this same letter, Paul says this about his method. Again, he will not change his message. He will preach Christ crucified. But look at his method. In Acts, or sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he says this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews or to the Greeks, to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that for many that they may be saved. What's Paul's paradigm? Don't cut the message. Cut the method. Even if it means discomfort on me. There's a great guy that I love to read. His name is Donald McGavran. He um, founded a school over here in Fullerton, the Evangelism and Church Growth School at Fullerton Seminary. A great guy. I love him. I was reading one of his books, and as I was reading one of his books, I kind of wrote in the margins his kind of approach to evangelism. And what he said was basically this, and I kind of summarized it. I don't think he actually said this, but I summarized it in the margins after reading this. He said, it's my job to take away every single offense except for the cross. And I thought, that's profound. That's profound. Take away every single offense, every single hurdle, every cultural, social thing that gets in the way. Take it all out. But you can't take the cross out. You can't change that. I remember realizing this for the first time kind of in a a funny way maybe. I was sitting in a student ministry meeting, and I just hired this person to do worship for me, and she was great. She was amazing. She did a phenomenal job. Just, Just great. She's on stage, she was singing this song, and I did not like the song, right? I did not dig it. I, was, I thought the style was dumb. I thought the arrangement was awful. I just didn't like it. And so I'm sitting there, you know, in Bible in my hand, like the good, you know, preacher guy, youth pastor, Bible in my hand, and I got to preach, and I'm like, oh, man, I just can't stand this song. The only thing I can think about is how much I don't like this song, right? I would never put this song on my top 10 iPod or thing. You know, I would never do that. I'm listening to this song, and she's playing it, and she's playing it. I think in my head, okay, so I'm going to have to sit her down on Monday. when She comes in and tell her, how can I say this in a nice way? Please don't play that song ever again. <laughs> That's as nice as I get. Well, then kind of what caught my eye, and in my peripherals, I look, and I see my students, and they are worshiping. I mean, I can see the emotion on their face. Some of them have their hands up. Some of them are crying. All of them are singing. All of them. Even kids that I would say are not yet believers, the ones that are close, they're getting it. They're feeling this song. And it is softening their hearts. And I looked at that group, and I looked back, and I thought, there's something wrong. And it's not the song, it's me. There's something wrong with me. And I sat there and I just thought, okay, if all the songs are about this meets my preference, I like this style. 
Uh, this sounds good to me. I like it. Pastor Paul likes it, therefore it's approved. Then you could sing it. I like it. It's upbeat. It gets me going. I'm going to buy the CD later. If I made all of the criteria for the music pleasing to me, then what is worship really about? Me. And I felt super convicted. I thought, I think I've made this youth group idolatrous. Right? We picked the songs according to my pleasure. So I went to her on Monday. We had that same meeting that I wanted to have, but it was a totally different meeting. I came to her and I said, I need to apologize. I'm not good at hiding my emotions. I'm sure you saw me when you sang that song, and you could tell I didn't like it. But you know what? I realized I was wrong. So let me tell you how we're going to evaluate every song from here on out. And she said, okay. I said, the words are mine. The style is theirs. The words are mine. Because I want the message of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected on behalf of sinners for the forgiveness of sins. I want that in my songs. But if you give me that to a polka beat, I'm cool with it. If it works, and if the kids like it, do it. If you've got to rap it, I don't care. I don't care how many beats per minute it has. I don't care how it works. If that method works, great. But I will evaluate it on the message. It's hard to do, though. But we have to come to grips. Is this what made the first century church so incredibly dynamic? Is they never cut the message, but they cut the method. So what does that mean? Well, that means just like in my case. Right? If the music style doesn't work anymore, what do we do? We cut it. If the preaching style doesn't work anymore, what do we do? We cut it. If the program doesn't work anymore, what do we do? We cut it. If Facebook, Instagram, Twitter don't work anymore and nobody's on anymore, what do we do? We cut them. But if culture doesn't like the Bible's view of marriage, what do we do? We preach it. Right? If culture feels like the Bible's picture of humanity's sinfulness is just too down and depressing, what do we do? We still preach it. If culture thinks that the call to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ and the loan is too close-minded, what do we do? We still preach it. We never cut the message, but we gladly and will painfully, as Paul and Timothy did, cut the method. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for who you are to us. And Father, we thank you that you are willing to make a sacrifice to reach us. You are willing to sacrifice your son to reach humanity. Christ, we thank you that you are willing to go to the cross to sacrifice yourself, to empty yourself, to become a servant of all, to bring us back in relationship with you. Father, I pray that you would give us a heart that is willing to, to sacrifice to reach those outside of this community. That we'd be willing to say, it's not about my preferences. It's not about the style. It's not about those things. I want the message and the message of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And if a style is going to be more effective or more, more practical or more effective, just as we would change our language to preach the gospel to another language, we have to change our style sometimes to reach people who that, that would be effective to. But God, you're not calling us to make a sacrifice like Timothy or calling us to make a sacrifice like Paul, at least not yet. God, I pray for our hearts that we be willing to make whatever sacrifice it takes to reach those that don't yet know you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This has been a Not Avenue Christian Church video production. If you'd like information about Not Avenue Christian Church, or after giving to your home church, you feel led to contribute to Not Avenue Christian Church, please visit our website at www.kacc.com. We thank you for watching and hope you'll join us again.